Uh, welcome to our unnamed podcast. Uh, we've got some names being cycled, um, including, what, Shoot the Bear? Shoot we, the Dancing Bear. Shoot the Dancing Bear. You remember that from Cormac McCarthy? Uh, Blood Meridian? I like that. He shot the bear. <laughs> <laughs> For no reason. For no particular reason. <laughs> <laughs> We're thinking about, um, we'd be reading March where I'm from, the, uh, <laughs> the, the Diggable Planets reference, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> of course, indicating the political and pop culture influences mm-hmm. simultaneously in the title. All at once, right? yeah. yeah. And so, I'm Tim. I'm introduce- Jesse, uh, English teacher. And I'm Gabriel. Do we all want to kind of say something about ourselves and where we're coming from in terms of maybe what we do or what we prioritize in our lives? Sure. Okay. Why don't you leave that? Okay, yeah. <laughs> Why don't you go that stuff? Again, my name is Gabriel. Um, you know, I'm uh, an, a practicing therapist in Los Angeles. Um, I'm also really interested in shamanic rituals and um, plant spirits and psychology, obviously. So that's part of what I'll be bringing to this as well as sort of some of my sort of political anarchist tendencies, I guess you might say. Awesome. That's a fantastic intro. (laughs) I'm Jesse Roa. I'm an English teacher, particularly interested in some of the stranger, more fucked up corners of the American pop culture landscape. Um, I enjoy the debris of what we consider American society, so like whatever, hip-hop, shitty comic books, television, Mm -hmm. movies, all that stuff but I believe that you can drag something worthwhile out of the detritus, so... Yeah, mm-hmm. which, you know, in, in the theoretical landscape I come from, being cultural studies, low culture. Mm-hmm. It's like what's often uh-huh. called low culture. I'm, I'm culture. in there. Yeah. In, the, in the garbage of the low <coughs> Yeah, like Zizek crawling around. <laughs> crawling the rubbish. <laughs> you need to get more used to trash. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All, right. All right, well, I'm Tim. I'm a professor of philosophy in the Bridge Program at Antioch University. Um, the Bridge Program kind of mirrors my theoretical interests because it's um, a program of popular education within the humanities dedicated towards kind of um, providing education to those usually marginalized or um, left out of um, the opportunity or really kind of like forced out for political reasons and economic reasons. Um, that's a structure or a function of power. And so I'm interested in philosophy. I'm, I'm, I teach Western philosophy. I'm kind of versed in Eastern philosophy as well. Um, I, my graduate training is in cultural studies, which of course doesn't, it's not anthropology. It's basically um, a critique of Marx um, and his notion of economic determinism and the idea that if you just change the economy, then the whole society will change. Uh, cultural studies believes you actually need to engage with cultural artifacts to drive political change. Mm-hmm. Whereas a traditional Marxist analysis w- wouldn't give a shit about pop culture, wouldn't give a shit about comic books or film, and say it's all just products of capital. Um, a cultural studies analysis will agree with that, but su- simultaneously see it as a point of intervention, mm-hmm. some place in which you can engage through critique to drive consciousness raising, um, and then hopefully work towards um, producing a greater variety of artifacts that mm-hmm lead to different political analyses and engagements and possibilities. Mm. Uh, politically speaking, consider myself an anarchist. Those are my political commitments. And um, I don't know, I'm just kind of interested in a whole bunch of shit. Mm-hmm. That's a good point of, uh, it's a good point to jump in on though, is that whole Marxist thing of whether we believe that any of this stuff is worthwhile as far as um, can we actually derive any meaning out of this on a greater level, right? Mm-hmm. Is this nothing but just a product, or is this is this actually evidence for something, right? Mm-hmm. right? And I feel like where I depart from some of that is, I'm in literature, obviously, and my perspective is way further off to the left, right? Which is to say that my, my viewpoint on it is, much of the real truth that can be revealed doesn't exist in these things that we create consciously, but often in things that we create unconsciously, right? Whether that be art, fiction, uh, film, all of this stuff is more accurate, I believe, a representation of what mm-hmm. we actually are as a society as opposed to these things that we happen to come up with consciously, right? Yeah. And that's always been sort of my feeling, but I think that'll be like an interesting point of divergence or at least an interesting point where we could come at some yeah. of this stuff. Yeah. Where if we're going to be discussing these things, right, what do we feel like some of the value of, some of this stuff is, and at least 
from my perspective, even the worst garbage has something to say on a enlightening level yeah. about the society itself. Uh -huh. So I think we could come at it from a variety of different perspectives, and it's cool that that's like a thing that we could come up with immediately, right? Yeah, and, and I tend to agree with that analysis. Mm -hmm. that there's basically uh, like one of my favorite theories, Joel Hooks, argues that pop culture, film, television is the dominant pedagogical mm -hmm. vehicle in the society as the kind of education system is under collapse under you know or under attack under neoliberalism um, that really what's happening is kids aren't being educated in schools into civic virtues and the role of the citizen in democracy and all that shit what they're learning much more about what it means to be a citizen is through television sh shows through um, film through mm -hmm. um, the internet and so uh, as a site of investigation popular culture is the site in which to kind of explore the molding of, of young citizens, right? Mm -hmm. or, and, and the kind of identities and politics that are being formed, right? So it, it, pop culture does give you the pulse of what's happening politically, right? right? what mm -hmm. I'm trying to argue. That's, that's the site of real intervention, which is the whole reason cultural studies exists, because that was kind of like being missed in the traditional Marxist analysis, which just dismissed it all as low culture. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. You know, it didn't need to be engaged with. It was just crap. Right. And that's that's really not the case, at least in any kind of radical left viable critique. Right? Yeah, and I think just to add to that, it's like to come back to our intentions for doing this podcast, in a sense, it's like there at one time was more sort of physical commons, the commons where people caught together, the town sure. squares, the bars, the places of voting, the conversations, the salons. And now that's in a much more sort of digital sphere mm -hmm. where we commune over these things in separate pods, uh, our AKA houses, and we all sort of like witness these things from separate points of view. And I think that, you know, from what I understand, one of the pieces of why we're here and what we're trying to do is that we see a real opportunity. There's a missed opportunity in pop culture and talking about these things in ways that can actually exact change. And we're all interested in that. Yeah. We're all interested in how uh, to have a more in-depth conversation that will lead to sort of a more um, critical analysis of what's happening in those, in those realms, basically. Right. Um, and a, dis, a general dissatisfaction that I hear from you guys and that I certainly feel when I'm reading about this stuff from just a sort of wider variety, you know, the articles, articles that come up on Facebook, Huffington Post, yeah. kind of stuff that I would sort of say is like, the you so-called critical perspective. Yeah, the so-called yeah. critical perspective, mm -hmm. which, you know, doesn't really do what I want it to do. I don't think it does what you both want it to do. No. And so we're here to we're here to kind of add a different voice um, to at least lend some sort of um, some kind of voice to what we think of as important in these in these sort of the new digital digital commons, if you will. Yeah, right. Absolutely. And that's a huge thing, I think. Because what well, you're the, describing the huge, is... the huge thing I think for Jesse is Jesse doesn't think change is fuck, fuck change. <laughs> <laughs> We're all fucked. <laughs> no, right? And my, it's about time we recognize it. <laughs> my belief is that we need to recognize that we're on a slow burn to the heat death of the universe. And that we just need to burn on to No, but I think what Gabe is talking about is essentially expressing one of the frustrations that I've had and that many people, I think, and every, but most people in this room have had as far as criticism and the culture has gone is that we've gone to a book report culture, right? Gotcha. Which is so that mm -hmm. we don't <clears throat> analyze things, right? We don't have much depth to much of the, what we produce. Mm -hmm. What instead we produce is the third grade book report. Mm -hmm. Here's what happened. Here's what's going on. That's all I can tell you. And I like it or don't like it. Yeah, and I can respond to yeah, and I'll, I'll end the, I'll end my essay by saying, I thought this was good, and I would buy this again. <laughs> you know, right. we don't really we've chosen to disallow a lot of that stuff in basically all forms of the criticism that we have now, right? Mm -hmm. Where we have um, Facebook articles like shitted on or comments commented on when they're not adequately representing what the populist ideas are, right? Mm -hmm. Game of Thrones is a fantastic show because everybody says it is and because everybody talks about right. it. But there's things that we can all be entertained by and talk about that are also garbage, right? Yeah. And that's part of what we're getting at here is that we can have a discussion about these things and still pull the real meaning out of that, which is 
Actually, you know, Game of Thrones is pretty shitty. But it does <laughs> say some stuff about what's currently going on that's interesting, so maybe it's worth talking about, right? Yeah. That's kind of where we're trying to arrive. Yeah, because and what and to add to that, things that aren't just garbage, right? Mm -hmm. But things that are doing political work, right? Right. So this idea that with that within everything there's politics. Mm -hmm. Within everything there's philosophy. And there right. are some really reactionary vile stuff that go hand in hand with things like the rise of a potentially, you know, fascist populism that's right. happening in the United States that I think you can make direct links to popular culture, in particular shows like Game of Thrones mm -hmm. that are justifying kind of colonial wars all over the place and yeah. justifying violence against women. There's, it's justifying all this kind of horrendous shit as just garbage entertainment, which just becomes a normative common sense mm -hmm. of acceptable shit that we want to see represented. And that's kind of like... Right. There's a there's a deeper level analysis of Game of Thrones than it was really exciting this yeah. week. I can't believe they burned the girl in the funeral pile. Yeah. Right. So by the end crazy. of crazy <laughs> by this, the end of this podcast, anybody listening should be able to come to the conclusion that Ramsey Bolton is Donald Trump. Like <laughs> 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 young Donald Trump. Is. That's right. basically what should happen. All right. So um, I'd like to shift directions a little bit if that's okay. Yeah. And I want to kind of ask. A couple of questions um, and ask Gabe for instance what led you to kind of the work you're doing now as far as mm -hmm. um, psychology as far as uh, practicing mm -hmm. as far as as well as your kind of um, your interest in shamanic stuff oh yeah sure um, let's see so I came to psychology by way of philosophy and um, I see what I do um, more and more as sort of like political activism on a very small level. So when I'm sitting with somebody in a room, I'm just basically trying to figure out the best way to help them live closer to their values and commitments. Mm -hmm. um, because, again, because I think that the window into everything, uh, I mean, the window in for me is psychology, mm -hmm. but what it, what it connects to is people's values, people's, uh, you know, the life that they envision themselves leading as more meaningful, not necessarily happy, not necessarily positive, not, it's actually just in search of meaning is what I'm trying to do mm -hmm. um, with people. Um, and so I see that as sort of a micro level political activism. Mm -hmm. um, and then in terms of, and I, by the way, I practice a kind of psychology that's called postmodern narrative, mm -hmm. which is looking at people's stories that they tell about themselves. And the sort of, the quick adage is sort of like, our reality is, con is socially constructed. Mm -hmm. It's constructed by the stories we tell and, and constructed by the stories others tell of us. Mm -hmm. And that can be you know, brought to a macro level or, or uh, other kinds of um, levels of, of meaning. Um, and then in terms of my shamanic work, um, you know, I've just always been interested in sort of like um, spiritual pursuits. And in particular in the past, I would say maybe almost a decade now, I've been really interested in the psychedelic experience and how that can lead us to think about our world, where we've gone wrong, our place in, quote unquote, the end of history, mm -hmm. um, and where we might go, um, what, these, what these medicines can teach us about where it is that we are now, and possibly point to a direction that is, you know, in my view, upholds some of the things that you know humanity is best at mm -hmm. you know celebration of love artistic pursuits things like that wow. um yeah so that's me yeah and do you do you see um a connection between like the shamanic work and this is a tough question but the shamanic work and kind of an analysis of pop culture or are those things which just generally inform your background and yeah. kind of the orientation yeah absolutely i see them to totally as intricately involved in the, in the sense that um, boy, this is a tough question, but I would say, um, when you enter into ritual, that's a, sh that's a shamanic ritual, um, one of the, one of the most sort of classical ways of describing it is an ego death. Mm. Um, and so, you know, if you think about the wording of that, that's something that people say all the time. My ego was destroyed, my ego died, mm -hmm. and I was sort of birthed into a new spirituality. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you think about that language, it's Freudian language. You know? yeah. we're, we're talking about the superego, the id, the ego. And 
And if that's the thing we're turning our attention to, mm -hmm. then it's like what, it, what that statement points to is that we're, we've become so discontent with the idea of our identity as an ego. Mm -hmm. And so what does it mean to destroy that and what happens after that? And that's something that psychedelic researchers are totally wrestling with. And that's why I think um, some of this work with, like, say, MDMA and, and trauma mm -hmm. is so important because it leads to different possibilities of identity. Mm -hmm. It leads to different possibilities of understanding time. Mm -hmm. It le leads to a more connected, denser web of consciousness right. um, that's immediately available to you. And you don't actually need the plants to experience it. It's just because we've been indoctrinated, we've been social, in the, the socially constructed idea of ego. Mm -hmm. So I see them as really in, interconnected because once you have that experience, you can't unhave it. Mm -hmm. You don't have to spend, as Terence McKenna says, uh, 25 years sweeping up around the ashram for some guru to say, now you've found it. Right. You can actually sit in a room, take you know five grams of psilocybin, and sit in silent darkness and have your com reality completely shifted. It will work mm -hmm. in the way that sometimes meditation can take years and years and years. And, you know, they can work in conjunction, obviously. But, uh, but I think we need, what it, what it points to is that we need radical shifts now. Yeah. And the plants are there to, to, to do that for us. Mm -hmm. I mean, they'll essentially knock you off any high horse that you think you, um, that you've been on, essentially. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I could go on for hours and hours and hours, but that's that's how I see myself linked into this uh, I idea of of changing identity mm -hmm. or or shifting consciousness. In mm -hmm. a sense. Yeah. It reminds me of the Grant Morrison thing where he was talking about how um, God, I'm, hopefully I'm not gonna mess up this anecdote where he says, um, <laughs> "Can you qualify who Grant Morrison is first? Well, oh, uh, Grant Morrison is a shamanistic uh, comic book writer whose entire work is both based in the occult and uh, mind expansive drugs mm -hmm. and also anarchism yeah. so we have mm -hmm. both yeah, he, sides he's, represented he's the missing member of our, <laughs> he's the person of our, who's not of here our, of our he's, he's here spiritually mm -hmm. um, and I, re I recall what he said when he was asked uh, about his uh, uh, UFO experience of Kathmandu <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> he said um I did not go to Kathmandu and ingest a whole bunch of drugs and then see aliens. I went to Kathmandu specifically to meet aliens, <laughs> and I happened to take drugs. <laughs> <laughs> so it's listen, weird. he's forming his own reality, and so are we right now. Yeah, that's a nice tie. I think how this all this pop culture stuff works. I mean, Grant Morrison is a great example of the way that somebody's kind of subverting from within a lot of. Mm -hmm. Not only comic books, but just philosophical concepts about the nature of reality and time, which of course then goes on to deeply influence something that brought us all together, which is True Detective, <laughs> right? <laughs> As kind of, um, Grant Morrison is kind of the unspoken. Well, I mean, let's let's be honest. Similar to the Matrix, right? Yeah. And the the reason it exists, right, on a, on many levels, I think conceptually, a lot of the stuff that happened in True Detective was. I mean, season we, one, by the way. Season one, <laughs> yeah, let's specify, please. Exclusively. <laughs> season, season two, we're going to either ignore that it exists or yeah, yeah. accept that it exists yeah. as evidence <laughs> yeah. that my man yeah, probably we'll, took most of his ideas. Yeah, we'll, treat, we'll treat that yeah. like uh, Heidegger's turn to Nazism <laughs> yeah. and just pretend that doesn't exist and just, and just stick to being in time. Right. <laughs> yeah. No, and I think that um, a lot of the ideas from that a lot were a lot of things that brought us together, right? Yeah. True Detective season uh -huh. one was sort of a text that we all sort of agreed on as at least sort of, um, if not necessarily a perfect piece, there is none, right? Mm -hmm. But at least a functional piece that was interesting on some level because it did connect. It was highly rated, right? It mm -hmm. connected with the society on a whole, but it had some very, um, it had some very out of the, out of the box things to say mm -hmm. that we normally don't accept from our pop culture. So we took uh -huh. extensively, we took a crime story basically, a simplistic one in many respects, right? Just, you know, girl dead and basic the, structure. Yeah, ba very basic plot really at the end of the day, but we're going to inject it with all the in ideas that at the time apparently were something that we should find interesting, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it would be the nihilism involved or any of the other stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, for example, we had the, oh God, I'm forgetting the name of the guy, but 
a lot of the nihilist principles in that particular show mm -hmm. were borrowed from fiction, right? Mm -hmm. a, lot right. Of, uh, a lot of the space-time stuff or the ideas about the universe, uh, a lot of those things were based on sort of weird quantum physics or mm -hmm. ways in. Um, mm -hmm. And these things sort of exist in the pop culture and maybe, I'm not even necessarily certain that the writer knew what he was doing when he inserted a lot of that stuff in. Right. I think he had read and consumed a lot of this and just it sort of came out into his writing. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. And that's kind of where I'd like to arrive at a lot of stuff is like, especially as a person who teaches kids, like my feeling is that more of what, if I sit there with a kid and ask him like, well, you look a little bit depressed today, what's the deal? I'm usually not going to get anything out of that, mm -hmm. right? But if I have a writing that day and something comes out where the kid reveals something of himself, they often do it without any, without any realization that that's what they've done, right? They reveal something of themselves without understanding that that's happened. Mm. And my way into a lot of things with what's going on with a lot of the world itself is to realize that most of what happens happens by accident. And which is kind of, I guess, an explanation for my sort of cynical worldview is that I sort of believe that there's, you know, very little that happens on a conscious level that we can affect. We sort of just roll through things and a lot of times what comes out, hopefully it comes out well and sometimes it doesn't. Mm -hmm. and that's sort of where I arrive at things is I liked to, I wanted to be able to teach, not necessarily because I had any particular draw to it initially, mm -hmm. but I realized as I was doing it, I can actually affect on a granular level something, but I can't really affect anything on a wider level because nobody really can, right? So they, we could have the greatest politi president, politician, whatever, they can only affect so much. Mm -hmm. So that's where I sort of come at things. Got it. Um, and then so relatedly, I want to ask you the same question, yeah. which is what brought you, I mean, because you, you're trained in Literature. Literature. Yeah. You're trained in education as a um, as a teacher, a public school teacher. Um, so you've got all your certifications by the state and all that. Right. Stuff. But um, useless as much of that is. Yeah, but how did you end up with the particular interest that you have? Is this just something that that has always been curious for you? I mean, because the the references that you made are really specific. Right, right, and they're like you said, they're 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 relatively marginal in the culture, yet they're really kind of profound, deep, heavy, often pessimistic, and it's not stuff you get at CSUN. That's stuff that you've brought with you, and right. then also you know injected into your overall you know philosophy. To use back of, lack of a better word. right, how'd you get there? How'd you get and with the interest of being into this doing this podcast? Okay, so my. Um, my feeling on things was that, especially when I was younger, I had always sort of felt um, it, there was a, not so much interest in necessarily what was happening on a, like whether I was trying to fit in with a group of people or whatever. I've always felt sort of a little older in that sense than I was. And I also had like, which is strange, a very acute sense of like death, right? So part of what I went through, especially when I was younger, was this idea that let me try to consume or read or learn as much as I can about the condition that we're in to where I can at least understand something of myself or the way things work so that I can justify to myself that we're here and that we have to exist in this, right? Mm -hmm. And I basically came to the realization that I'd rather be able to think about things than not. Therefore, mm -hmm. it's better to be alive than dead. Well, so very Descartes. <laughs> yeah, right? Right. right. So that's kind of where I came down on it. But a lot of the stuff I read and a lot of the things that I was attracted to, a lot of it was less content, with, but more like I want to engage with the eccentric, weird shit or a lot of the strange mm -hmm. stuff that happens on the margins mm -hmm. because I feel like a lot of that is more accurately representing where we are and a lot of times some of that stuff either doesn't become popularized or it achieves only a cult or niche status is that so few of us are willing to really acknowledge the truth of some of the stuff that occurs in that. Mm -hmm. So something like True Detective mm -hmm. can work and be popular. Why? Well, I mean, 
it's a crime story, but I think if it was just another crime story, I don't think people would have tripped over it the way they did. CSI Miami. Right. Like, yeah, you would be New CSI Orleans, Miami. The fuck it is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Something on UPN or whatever, yeah, right? right? I think the reason people identified with that was that it presented marginalized ideas for you in a presentable way. Mm -hmm. So we had a crime story with a specific a easy stars. plot, right? Yeah. But we've also got this weird depiction of pessimism and nihilism presented in really sort of obscure mm -hmm. fictional texts or even mm -hmm. philosophical texts, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to present that to you. The Nietzsche, for example, that was in so much of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're going to make that palatable for a greater audience, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And get them to think about these things for the first time mm -hmm. that a lot of those people that had watched that show really thought about. Yeah. Like, remember when that show was going on, and we would see the Facebook conversations or the Twitter conversations or whatever that was happening around that show. Yeah. That was the first time a lot of people had ever considered some of those ideas. Yeah. Some of the stuff that was happening in the car for Yeah, and, and the show was yeah. super pedantic in that way. And yeah. yet still able to pull it off somehow. Right. Like those long car rides. Exactly. It's like the audience was like Marty Hart there, the um, Woody Harrelson character, allowing right. these diatribes for three minutes about the nature of pessimism. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And that's sort of where... I feel like um, I sort of arrived in the same area where I wanted to see the marginalized stuff, mm -hmm. but I often felt it wasn't presented right. So I have these very specific eccentric tastes even mm -hmm. where I'm really interested in certain types of things and maybe not so much others, but mm -hmm. I can still see that there's something underlying all of that. Anytime we create something, there's something underlying it. So yeah. I liked the more marginalized stuff because I ser I felt more marginalized, right. not necessarily on a social level, but that I just felt that I had this more acute sense of my place in the universe, uh -huh. which was essentially nothing. So I wanted to know as much as I could about what can we do to make this worthwhile or whatever. Right. But I wanted to know something of myself before we went into that. Yeah. So that's kind of where I arrived. So would it be fair to say then for you with, uh, in terms of true detective and viewing it, uh, watching it as somebody who, I mean, it connected, it sounds like to a really early version of how you started to make sense of reality, right? Yeah. Like the rust coal actually right. for you in some ways is what easily identifiable because he is attracted to those more eccentric. And was there any sense like, holy shit, I'm seeing somebody that thinks like me represented. Right. And I think that was a huge part of the popularity of that show is that more people felt feel that way, mm -hmm. I think, yeah. than are willing to either let on yeah. or are willing to accept, really. And yeah. I think the Russ Cole, it's not a perfect analog, just like nothing ever of really course, is, yeah. right? Um, I, I remember one of his diatribes early on in the car ride or whatever is the thing about, um, I lack... Legati is the guy. Ligotti, Thomas, Thomas Legati is the guy, the, the writer, mm -hmm. if anybody's interested who's listening to this, into where a lot of these ideas come from. A very pessimistic, um, kind of horror writer, I mm -hmm. guess I would say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Although it's more, existentialist. Yeah, it's more existentialist, I guess. It's not like Stephen King or something like that. Yeah. Um, and he, what the Russ Cole diatribes are often arriving at is the idea of uh, what was his famous line about suicide, right? Was the thing. Uh, I lack the constitution for suicide yeah. or whatever, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Which is um, sort of, I feel like, a more immature way of arriving at the sort of pessimism that I eventually got to, which is where I accept most of the stuff happening around us, which is to say we have very little control over most things. We live in a universe where there's very little control over anything, mm -hmm. where we there can be a solar flare and we could just be done like right now. Mm -hmm. Like th anything could happen essentially. But I found some appreciation in thought, right? And the idea that yeah. what what do we have as humans that make mm -hmm. this all worthwhile? Mm -hmm. We have the ability to consider things. Mm -hmm. We have the beauty of being able to express our thoughts. We have all these things. And that's sure. sort of where I arrived at. And I think that's the next step which is almost the end of True Detective, right? right? Precisely, which is, yeah. Which is kind of like, here, you found some reason to continue on, yeah. right? There's some yeah. level of optimism. No longer is it, remember the famous end of the thing where a lot of people got mad about, right? He looks up into the sky, and they stole that from a comic book, by the way. Yeah. Um, he looks up into the sky, and <laughs> it's all dark, right? It's all black, and he sees the stars, and it's like, well, it looks like the dark is winning, and then Russ Cole tells him, no, no, it's, you know, 
you're just looking at it the wrong way. The light is winning. It's just taking a while, right? Mm -hmm. So at least you can reclaim some level of optimism. I think that's where, um, uh, that's where I sort of arrived at. Mm -hmm. and so like a lot of the texts I always were attracted to were these sort of weirder, eccentric, mm -hmm. maybe even dark texts, mm -hmm. stuff like that. But I was always looking for a way to rationalize why we're here. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what most of those things are looking for, even if they don't arrive at maybe a great answer. Yeah, like yeah. Gabe talks about, a, if not a search for a construction of meaning, mm -hmm. right. right, through one's life. Mm -hmm. I find it really interesting. One of the reasons I wanted to do this podcast is thinking, or why I wanted to do it with you two gentlemen, um, once again, Gabe coming from kind of the shamanic um, psychotherapeutic realm and Jesse coming from not only the literary realm but a very particular margin of the literary realm um, and deeply influenced by philosophies of pessimism. I wouldn't quite say nihilism. No, I wouldn't say that because I think the nihilist doesn't care that these things are happening necessarily. Right. I think that I definitely care that they're occurring, but <laughs> yeah. it's just bothersome to me. I'm yeah, sure. right. But these two perspectives, yeah. right? Because I, I also, you know, have my own experience with hallucinogens, and so I feel that I can, like Gabe said, once you get the get the message, kind of hang up the telephone. Like once you got right. it, you can't unsee it. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm able to understand what Gabe talks about, and I'm also um, deeply moved by Jesse's analysis of kind of. Um, chaos and randomness and mm -hmm. kind of um, what's the word? Not futility, but um, uh, I wouldn't say it's necessarily futility so much as its purpose on just straight up a biological level, right? Right. Which is a sort of futility on its own, but yeah. it's one in which we can accept, right? Yeah. So, like, we're all evolved. We're here. Yeah. We've, you know, we've biologically evolved. But I feel like the ideas that we come up with allow for a more right. enriching, yeah. beautiful place for whatever our, you know, descendants are. Right. And I think that's worthwhile. Yeah. Which I think is... So the experience of yeah, itself. So yeah, I think that is, is worthwhile right. as opposed to just accepting that it's all over with and nothing is worthwhile. Right? right. But even still, the analysis holds, there's a radical dichotomy, right? Or mm -hmm. radical difference in your two worldviews. Um, at least that as I understand it. Um, because on, on the one hand, the kind of shamanic ritualistic perspective, which is going to grant um, the exact opposite of powerlessness, right? It's that the actually mm -hmm. the universe is purely there for you, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's almost um, a game and, and, and um, the individual is actually God in disguise mm -hmm. in, in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um, lost within its own dream, but um, mm -hmm. totally safe within yeah. that dream. Yeah. And um, just living a life of, ex in order to experience the highs and lows all being, um, giving definition and mm -hmm. shape and form, right? Mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. to one's experience, right? Which is actually God, right? Dreaming. Right. <clears throat> um, and then Jesse coming from this much more kind of materialist in philosophical terms perspective um, but I'm, I'm, I want to watch this dialectic play out over yeah. the course of the conversations and how that comes into influence yeah. particular ideas yeah. right because I feel like I'm somewhere in the middle uh -huh. Uh -huh. on that stuff you know and so it's just interesting because I feel like it's almost like external manifestations of two warring principles in my own mind that I've never, <laughs> that I've never <laughs> been able to reconcile. Yeah. Right? And that, Yo, that I've come to think that I'm, out yeah, yeah, I'm never going to reconcile them, but I'm okay with that, but it leads to kind of a constant tension or different yeah. lenses upon which I can view any particular artifact, any pop culture yeah. film or whatever, and, um, and read it from these different ways. Um, the other thing that kind of what I think is really interesting, coming from kind of like, a, you know, this political anarchist perspective, or, you know, I'm, 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 I'm trained, I'm schooled in kind of um, a tr a traditional Marxist analysis as well. Mm -hmm. And this notion of ideology, right, which is going to play real deeply into my analysis of pop culture. Mm -hmm. How are these ideas, you know, to use Althusser, creating an imaginary relationship? to the yes. real conditions of existence, yeah. mm -hmm. right? So for a Marxist analysis, all these pop culture ideas are basically to create an idea matrix or 
um, a worldview which fundamentally masks mm -hmm. the exploitative nature of capitalism, right? Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. And so while that simultaneously exists, what I thought of while Jesse was speaking, first time I've had this kind of thought, and it plays right into psychology, right? But it is, okay, what if Jesse's right, right? And the, the, the universe kind of is that way, the way that you described, kind of um, random chaos, you can be eaten by a sunburst at any moment, right? Then what type of psychological defenses mm -hmm. must human beings create mm -hmm. in order to escape from that reality? So we get hints at the actual reality from a Russ Cole character. But mainstream representation, mainstream pop culture, like Jesse says, does not represent the universe that way, right? The classic right. example being like this positive thinking zeitgeist sure. we're going sure. through, sure. right? Sure. So, so, but pointing like what, what? So, if ideology, ideology is consciously and unconsciously constructed um, in Marxist language in order to mask the fundamental nature of reality, which is capitalist exploitation. What happens if, it's actually deeper than that, what happens if the products of our pop culture are ideological, but they're not masking the capitalist relations of exploitation. Mm -hmm. What they're masking is man's fundamental aloneness, alienation from the universe itself, really inhospitable, ugly truths about the nature of the real mm -hmm. itself, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And the reason that things are illusory ideological is not because of capitalism but mm -hmm. because they're the fundamental horror of existence mm -hmm. that we need to defend ourselves against yeah. i think that's a really interesting kind yeah, of notion it makes me really think of the uh you know I, I think it was hegel who talked about or maybe it was heidegger i think it was heidegger mm -hmm. who talked about thrownness right. being thrown into being thrust into a world that's you know really hostile to you right. you don't have a choice you're yeah. actually tossed into here and you have to make the best of it yeah and how are you going to make the best of a place that's fundamentally hostile to you yeah sure. um and then you know the psychedelic experience i think in particular is really healing in that sense because it presents you with i mean that's that's a very enlightenment kind of like thought that right. you're sort of thrown here you didn't ask for it yeah and but you know there's this other perspective where imagine yourself being pulled imagine yourself being not thrown but pulled yeah pulled into the world that you're Existence is wanted, desired, loved, like it yeah. needs you, yeah. um, which is, it runs very contrary to a lot of sort of what we might call pessimistic thinking. Yeah. But the, the only reason I bring up these two dichotomies is because I think they kind of illustrate sort of what we've been talking about yeah. here. And, and I want to make the point that they can simultaneously exist. Sure. Right? Like that they can actually be coexisting yeah. and be very confusing and maybe never reconcilable. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they can, some can take forms of extreme positivism with, you know, Buddhist yoga and think it and it'll come yep. to you kind of shit. Right. Or, it, you know, it, yeah. or you can just go down the other route, which is a sort of nihilist, it doesn't matter. Yeah, sure. Type of thing, you right. know. Um, but I want to kind of assert, or at least throw out the idea that there's a simultaneity happening. Yeah. That they can actually, that they, they can actually dance with each other in, uh -huh. in, a, in a weave. And we've been kind of talking in the, in the way of the, um, the tripartite, yeah, right. right? That there's yeah, yeah. like a there's there's which is an ancient concept in, in, yeah. in philosophy, and philosophy. it's a weave, you know. It's yeah. it that's that's weaving together, and that's that's also language we use about stories. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when we talk about telling stories, like he wove together a story, or she sure. wove together a story, right. yeah. or a dense web of lies. Right. You know, those are all narrative stories about about all these conflicting things being thrown together in a sense, right. and sort of. Where do we arrive? Do we have to arrive at any sure. binary, yeah. or can we kind of always be playing within the different ideas? Yeah, sure. But I want to kind of like. I also want to give airtime to you, Tim, and sort of like to. I won't be able to put it as eloquently as you, but to kind of like think about this same fundamental question: What brings you here now right. to this uh, to this idea of having conversations that others might find rewarding? Yeah, um, I think that, as has been expressed early, what what I think is interesting about the three of us getting together and talking is that I'm consistently more interested in the stuff we talk about than anything I read mm -hmm. anywhere. And I don't know what that is. I don't know if that, like, you know, I could use Marxist language to talk about kind of like 
filters which which control the amount of kind of analysis one is able to do. And that's like Jessica about earlier, it's not even a conscious thing. Mm -hmm. The people in dominant, in particular mainstream media, are not there because mm -hmm. they have a critical perspective. If they had a critical perspective, they mm -hmm. they would have been driven out and marginalized and trying to create podcasts just like we're doing mm -hmm. anyway. Mm -hmm. Right? And so I think the first thing that pulls me here is that um, I enjoy our stuff. I enjoy the way we think. I laugh. Um, I feel intellectually um, invigorated and inspired after we talk. And whenever I talk to both of you, I can watch an, a text that I hadn't watched before. You might introduce me to something. Um, you might, or it's something that I've watched and you bring something, mm -hmm. some level of analysis or some additional resources, whether it's like True Detective and just saying, hey, are you familiar with Grant Morrison? Right. And then I dive deeply into that and get super interested. And then that ties into a whole bunch of shit I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I'd like to be able to share that kind of mm -hmm. experience with others because it's just a more enriching experience for me. Yeah. Right. And I think it, I think it's fun, you know, which is a huge part about it. And, sure. <clears throat> And we've had these conversations with others in public, and they've been, I think, fun for Receptive, others as yeah. well. Mm -hmm. and, and enlightening, you know, not to toot our own horns or whatever. But, <laughs> like, but trying to be, like, objective about it. I think, yeah. you know, that's what was kind of, I mean, one thing is that's what we're all paid for, to use capital expenditure. I mean, that is what yeah. you do in, in therapy, right. what you do with teaching, what I do with teaching, right? It's like we're actually trained to do this. Mm -hmm. um, but on a more personal level, I think what led to my particular kind of interests in philosophy, in radical politics and praxis, and in cultural studies is, you know, I've lived a life of what I've described in some of my own writing as kind of liminal experiences, mm -hmm. experiences that, um, you know, push one's consciousness. Uh, one being, you know, my use of um, hallucinogens, you know, 19, 20 years old, and having some really profound kind of ego-shattering experiences. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was actually at one point diagnosed with temp substance-induced uh, temporary schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was walking wow. around, you know, you know, thinking that I was Jesus, basically. I was thinking I was God. Um, mm -hmm. And I didn't have any kind of cultural language to be able to... Yeah to encapsulate my experiences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I basically had shamanic experiences uh -huh. and did not have any theoretical language outside of yeah. um, the, the, my Christian heritage um, by, you know, by ancestry. I mean, it's not practicing Christianity in my family or anything, but that's kind of the cultural baggage we have yeah. right here. So I had yeah. that framework to be able to put this stuff in. Right. Right. And as, you know, Alan Watts says, there's only one Jesus and you ain't him <laughs> yeah. kind of a thing. Um, whereas if, I was trained in Taoism or Buddhism or Hinduism, I would have known this is actually the core experience of all these religious traditions, uh -huh. and, and their whole basis is to prepare one in order to have that experience and then not freak the fuck out. Yeah. <laughs> I was not trained in those yeah. things, I freaked the fuck out. And so what that led to was kind of psychic collapse and me getting into kind of dark underbellies of shit. And um, I was, we could talk about this some other time, but I was eventually incarcerated. Mm -hmm. And I ended up doing um, just over eight years in prison, in mm -hmm. state prison, <clears throat> which was, um, I mean, you, how do you talk about like eight years of time? You can't. Yeah. Um, but it was just so formative um, in my thinking, in my radicalism, in my uh, intellectual growth. And that was largely driven... Um, Well, basically, I'll tell a story. Like, I remember I was locked up, and I turned on the radio one night, and everybody had gone to sleep. The um, cell doors were all shut, and I put on the radio, and I heard um, Alan Watts on KPFK on 90.7, who's an old beat philosopher, mm -hmm. in introducing Eastern philosophy to Western audiences. And he was talking about the city as organism. And it was just really interesting, that his voice was very poetic. Um, and it was just fascinating. He was talking about looking at the whole of things mm -hmm. and how things interconnect and that the city can actually be viewed as, a, as an organism. And then he talked about that view as from kind of a Taoist perspective. And then he went on to talk about mystical experience. Mm -hmm. And once I finished hearing that lecture, I was like, holy shit, that's describing exactly what had happened with my perception, with yeah. my consciousness. And it started to piss me off. 
because I realized I was now in prison, li largely because of alienation and isolation uh -huh. and psychotic break. Interesting. And no one was there to help me. No one was there to understand what had happened to me. No one could put it in context. I was totally alien. And then there's this whole world. All I have to do is turn on the radio and I find not only is there somebody talking about it, but talking about it from a tradition that's 5,000 years old and this is as old as anything in, in right. our society and that nobody knew what the fuck I was talking about. Mm -hmm. And so that pissed me off. So I turned on the radio the next morning, then I heard a lecture um, from Noam Chomsky on the same radio station. Mm -hmm. And this was um, right after 9-11, and it was um, him talking about the upcoming invasion of Afghanistan. Uh -huh. um, and I, after that, I just immediately just started bawling. I just started crying. Mm. Um, because there were so many pieces mm -hmm. that, in my worldview, that were just clicking into place, clicking into place. The world, I didn't even know how nonsensical the, and how, how much my internal headspace didn't make sense. Mm -hmm. But as I'm hearing Chomsky and putting that together with the Watts, um, all of a sudden I, I'm able to make sense of the mm -hmm. world in radically new ways, in, in, in ways in which were affirming to me. Mm -hmm. that said you're not fucking crazy, mm -hmm. that you're actually seeing the world in exceptional ways, ways that are supported by some of our greatest spiritual and intellectual traditions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I got really angry because there was nothing I could do because I was stuck, I was yeah. incarcerated. And, um, and so what I decided to do was just radically discipline myself, to just totally give my life in order to overcoming all these obstacles, all these tra tragedies that I had suffered, and out of an act of anger, revolt, mm -hmm. rebel, mm -hmm. throw the shit. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just sat down and basically read for eight years. Mm -hmm. It's all I did was meditate, read, mm -hmm. work out. That's all I did. So, and you know, mm -hmm. all the shit that comes with prison, you know, mm -hmm. I survived however, however I needed to. And then, um, and so basically that's how my intellectual pursuits got started and that shit grew and grew and grew and I started reading and that branched off into all kinds of other stuff and mm -hmm. by the time that was done um, you know I had a nice philosophical background but also the experiences of prison had so deeply radicalized me in a material way right. because I was in prison and I'm like 20 years old mm -hmm. and I'm looking around and I'm this white kid from a relatively privileged background and I'm looking around and I'm seeing seas of people of color Seas of people of color that didn't have a psychotic break, right. that didn't weren't consciously making choices to be bad, to mm -hmm. be like a gangster, which is kind of like what I was doing, right? They're just there. They're just there because that is what is expected. The structures of the society determine mm -hmm. one kind of like in, in, you know, like in a collapsed economy, right? Kind of the economic structures we have. You have like some certain percent of the population, which is not needed mm -hmm. in capitalism mm -hmm. and um, those communities are usually racially structured it's mm -hmm. usually people of color people who have been historically exploited mm -hmm. right and so you've got seas of black and brown people non-conducive to the creation of capital and then what you do is um, you know you just put up fences and you ship black and brown youth kids whatever into these prisons then you arm it and then you've got these just these fenced in collapsed societies, largely of people of color, doing all they can to kind of survive. Mm -hmm. And it was so deeply racist and so deeply monstrous and horrible. I'm talking about like monoliths of machinery of just grinding human beings to nothing, right? Mm -hmm. Just throwing lives away to, to the point where when you actually see it and you understand what it is, you cannot, you, you can't rationalize it, you can't talk about it and do adequate justice. It's like the fucking Holocaust. You shouldn't even make movies about it because you fucking can't do that kind of horror justice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we have this shit, these, these seas, you know, of, of just violence and racial destruction all over the place. And I guess being enmeshed in them uh, and having to survive them, like, there was nothing, like, I couldn't not see it, mm -hmm. right? So that deeply informs my political work. To change, I'm interested in changing that. I'm interested in, you know, really prison abolition uh -huh. in the same way I'm interested in a lot of 
abolition of monstrous institutions mm -hmm. um, like slavery. Mm -hmm. uh, and for me, that what is, the radical question is, you know, to strike at the root. What is the root of how things exist in our society? Education, mm -hmm. you know, the consciousness of the populace which allows things to exist, right? Mm -hmm. And so for me, the most radical act one can do is to engage at the educational level. So that's how I got into philosophy, that's how I got into teaching, always with this informed by this radical politics. Because for me, that is the most effective strategic uh, political move, teaching, mm -hmm. right? Because I'm a radical Democrat too, I believe that we all need to share some assumptions. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those assumptions are, are marginalized by ideology, by capitalism. These kind of critiques are just not in consciousness, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And so that, that brings me to teaching, that brings me to philosophy, and what brings me to this podcast is through kind of teaching, through my continual research, through my education, what I've realized is that so much of mass education is done through popular culture. What creates our common sense? What makes the prison necessary? It's much more about um, television, film, books, than it is what's happening in the classroom. Right? Mm -hmm. And so for me, sitting in this pocket, that's because this is a radical act, act. Of, of challenging representations which normalize monstrous institutions mm -hmm. and I want to investigate the ways in which those things are allowed to exist mm -hmm. basically long way yeah, yeah long-winded long -winded. <laughs> no, that's whatever that's yeah. the stuff we're looking for yeah yeah, yeah but it, it's hard to talk about that stuff without without getting it I think yeah the you background it. yeah right? like, yeah and and so would it be fair to say that the folks that you know might be interested in this podcast are going to come up with all of those themes like the uh, the brief descriptions we've given upon given of ourselves and why we're here that that's going to come to bear on a, a host of different subjects yeah. whether that's film or literature lots of stuff or you know poetry art practices um you know psychedelics um all, all, all will be sort of addressed here. The shittiness of Game of Thrones. The shittiness yeah. of Game of Thrones. <laughs> well, that's yeah. definitely coming up, by the way. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I think what you're getting at is essentially true. And also, I think, um, just to try to come back to something a little bit, I think a lot of these things that we're talking about are a lot more universal than we think they are. Mm -hmm. right? I think a lot of these sort of strange thoughts or whatever the, it is, whatever weird fucking thing you happen to be thinking about, in some lonesome corner of your house or mm. whatever. Yeah. Most people have had these thoughts. It's funny that you brought up the Alan Watts in prison thing. Yeah. Um, talking about the city as an organism, right? Because, I mean, even the things that we express of ourselves creatively are these universal ideas. These ideas, mm -hmm. there's very little that's unique, right? Mm -hmm. I remember I tr tried to write a little bit. And I remember I wrote a book and I never published it because it's embarrassing. And, uh, but I had in it, essentially, a sentient city, or I described the avenues as veins, right? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, so, and it was, it's essentially, it is an organism, Similar right? Similar to Cannibal Ox. Yeah, <laughs> which, <laughs> right, the yeah. Cannibal Ox reference, yeah. the city is, you know, the mm -hmm. cold vein, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Or you fucking read, I'm going to make another Grant Morrison reference, um, the, his Doom Patrol, where there's a street which is sentient and also transvestite. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, like, these weirdo ideas, even the strangest stuff, to bring it all back, like, any, all of these ideas that we have about whether it's true detective and the pessimism of it, that, you know, really actually people have these thoughts, right? And that um, this is more relatable on a, on a more worldwide or at least American perspective than we think it is. Mm -hmm. Or a lot of these whatever strange thoughts... Um, the way that you're expressing your distaste for the structure of things, right, essentially comes from, not maybe necessarily the same, but a similar place as a dude who hates his role in society mm -hmm. and decides that the only way for him to get out of it is to vote Donald Trump or something. Right. right? This, it's, yeah. a, it's a populism That's that a great we point. It's a populism that we didn't know existed, right? Right. Where the strange, marginalized voices are really the voices of the majority who have not either been trained mm -hmm. to let them out or are afraid or it, whatever. And to, make, and to make an intervention on that, Jesse, that's exactly why I think education is key. Because I see that populist support, and for me as a radical anarchist, 
-hmm. Every kind of fascism is a failed revolution, mm -hmm. right? And so those are all my people mm -hmm. that are being, at some point, intervened on educationally, misdirected, misguided, ideologically right. speaking, and now supporting shit that is contrary not only to their own interests, but pretty much everybody's interests except for a very narrow sector of the population. And so for me, this education of diving in at wherever that point of finding that out, mm -hmm. right? So, but I didn't mean to cut you off. I just wanted to make that point. No, no, no. But I think it's a, it was a good interjection. And I think like a lot of the current, um, uh, the current political situation that we have occurring is representative of that, right? Where what's happening essentially on a grand level is a sort of a get like a, a weird sort of semi idiotic version of it but a bit of a revolution right mm -hmm. where we have two out of three people that are left running for the presidency of the United States who are representing either outsiderism or yeah. let's go ahead and everybody involved in the power structure is screwing you mm -hmm. um, I'm here to fix that. Even if it's purely demagoguery and, you know, the form of a Trump or whatever, or if it's actual in the form of like a Bernie Sanders or whatever. Mm -hmm. But it's amazing to me that the ideas are so universalized amongst people in general that you see this phenomenon that I'm seeing where a person that is really fed up with the fact that they know that Bernie Sanders is going to lose mm -hmm. the primary will not vote for a Hillary Clinton because mm -hmm. they want the revolution, right? Well, it's a popular term now is the accelerationism, right? Yeah. If we're going to end up in the shit, I just want to accelerate things yeah, right. becoming shitty, right? Because it's a right. idea. Right? Yeah. So I just want to get there. Let's yeah. just get to Over that already, yeah. Yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And, I mean, for me, um, I'm a believer in the lesser of two evils and I believe that most decisions that we make mm -hmm. in life, not all, but most decisions are ostensibly about the lesser of two evils. There's very few, like, mm -hmm. just generally perfect decisions, except, like, you know, maybe I should go get something to eat right now or whatever. Right. But, like, there's this idea that's happening now where the, the marginalization has crept up into becoming... A uh, dominant form. A dominant form, right? This yeah. is what people want. They want to be expressive of it. And the thing that I think a lot of people... Are terrified about like let's say social media or whatever is that it lends voice to this right and I think that this is where the Marxist analysis of stuff where your film your television all that stuff is a product of capital right mm -hmm. that's a product of them trying to get you to buy something or whatever well now that social media exists and now that you can erupt into a Twitter uproar about something as soon as it's available, now we see that those things actually do affect the product, right? Yeah. There is something that can be done to sort of affect things, even if on a certain level um, it comes off as not really getting much done mm -hmm. or it doesn't really do much that's super revolutionary. But I think that's most of what, just like evolution biologically is, everything is incremental, right? And sometimes very incremental. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where... Um, uh, I think that's where sort of there's a lot to be gained from understanding what's happening with the popular culture in general. We can see where the yeah. incremental movements yeah. are. So when you, you wouldn't know, have a Mr. Robot five years ago, right? There was no way that exists years ago, and if it did, it would be seen as this incredibly controversial thing. Yeah. And I can't believe some of the shit they sneak through. Right. Robot. But even think about what's happening on Mr. Robot. It's a, it's a very universalized television show. It's something that yeah. has existed in forms before, right? Mm -hmm. sure. So much of its DNA is in shit from the 90s. Yeah, right. So, Consciously so. Like, right. So yeah. like Fight American Club. American Psycho, Fight Club. American Psycho. Mm -hmm. There's even a planetary reference in it. Yeah. There's all sorts of stuff in there, right, yeah. that can, that's been brimming or mm -hmm. brewing before. Yeah. And then we just continue to... It's kind of like an upside down pyramid, I've always thought of it. Right? So like the idea starts where something is created or born, right? Mm -hmm. And then we stack ideas on top of it, but there's always that initial creation, like there's that initial created impulse. Mm -hmm. And then everything else that we stack on top of that can just grows off of that mm -hmm. initial. It's incremental, mm -hmm. but it 
create something larger, or at least grander, or whatever. So we have something like Mr. Robot, which can address the political, um, w the political state of our times, right? Yeah. But is also built out of the DNA of stuff that we've seen many sure. times before, yeah. Yeah. right? The hacker drum. I mean, that's not yeah. new, but yeah. it's it's interesting regardless. Right? This is something that I've wanted, been wanting to get both of your thoughts on. Mm -hmm. um, if it's okay, if I make a little bit of a non sequitur, but it's related to Mr. Robot. Fuck yeah. it, non sequiturs are great. Maybe someday we'll be able to explore this a full podcast of this. But you're yeah. you're referring to this idea that that the ideas are stacked on. So there's an sort of original idea, mm -hmm. and if we place, if we sort of intentionally place our our uh, gaze upon sort of Aristotelian ideas of catharsis within mm -hmm. the sort of the Grecian epics and sure. the, the Grecian plays. Yeah. I and mean, how the spe specifically one of the things he says is that catharsis is meant for the audience to experience what's going on. And so after it, they feel as though they've had whatever tragedy was happened right. to them. And so it, they, they have sort of some understanding of what that experience is like because they've sort of lived they've through lived it. it. Now, does that function yeah. to satiate like a bloodlust? That's my point. It's sort of like with Mr. Robot, does, is, can that actually work as a galvanizing feature in, in terms of turning it into something like an Occupy? Mm -hmm. Or is, does it actually placate our yeah. sort of our impulses to actually do things? Right. Because we're viewing it, we're living through it, we're like riveted by this guy's mm -hmm. journey. And does that actually create an impot impotence yeah. in us where we then experienced it and then cannot move beyond that in the real world yeah. because we sit back and we're viewing it in our little houses and we feel a frustration of, of how difficult it is and who even has that kind of knowledge to be that kind of an amazing hacker. Right. And so it be actually becomes as an over... It, all, it, it can function psychologically as overwhelming yeah. in some ways. Um, so to well, and on point, top of the fact that Mr. Robot has a real shitty idea of what revolution is, the <laughs> sure. idea that anonymous hacktivist collective is going to take down the world by putting a bunch of cats on the IDF yeah. website. <laughs> oh yeah, you know what I mean? Like we're well, coming for be you. Beware! Yeah. Be afraid of us! And yeah. then they do shit like take over a website, which who gives a fuck? Which then that yeah. limit can does that actually limit our imagination as to what's possible in a revolution? Right. Because that's what's being presented to us is what's possible. Mm -hmm. You know, and so how do we think, how do we move beyond that? You know, mm -hmm. I've often thought about this in relation to Fight Club, like Fight Club as, as catharsis, or yeah. Mr. Robot as catharsis, or True Detective as, as catharsis in the yeah. way that they don't actually lead to real world change. It adds to just, it happened for us. We felt some way about watching it. Mm -hmm. And then beyond that, we're just waiting for the next one. Yeah, and this is, this is a great question, and it's a very contemporary question. It's the one that uh, plagues Noam Chomsky and Slavoj Zizek, <laughs> leading them to uh, publicly attack one another. <laughs> Basically shit on each yeah, other. Yeah, and I think yeah, it's a classical question, right? Like, does consciousness raising affect change, or, mm -hmm. do, or do people just consume images? Yeah. yeah. No. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Jess? Well, I, I'm going to go back to what Gabe was saying as far as does this... Um, breed sort of an impotence, right? Yeah. An inability to affect real change on any level. Um, like, if people believe that there's going to be some overnight revolution or even one that takes place over 50 years or whatever, mm -hmm. I don't think that's possible. I don't think that can exist in the... Just as I mentioned that like sort of ideas build and build on top of each other, yeah. I think also that governments have built and built and built a structure that um, is so mm -hmm. intricate and complex mm -hmm. that there's no way, first of all, to permeate it and that it's su that's such an intricate web, there's no way of destroying it without destroying a significant portion of the population, first of all, mm -hmm. and also just our ability to live a certain quality of life, yes. right? Yes. So there's... Um, if we were just to just say, fuck it, let's just abolish it all. We're doing away with government, we're getting rid of it, we're just, you know, whoever becomes the next president just gets bodied, guillotine style, French Revolution, whatever. We're going to start up our new status. Um, you're going to go through a severe moment of confusion and inability to keep things together. And it's, you're not going to have the systems in place. And at mm -hmm. this point, the structure has been so far developed that... It makes a lot of things operate more efficiently, even if they don't operate 
um, well for us on an emotional or moralistic sense, right? So we've been, t we've been turned into cogs of the machine, but at this point, like, your, your fucking clock on the wall, the gears in that are not jumping out and breaking loose. They're just there. Mm. That's it. Mm. And maybe this is a little too much of my pessimism coming in, but I feel like that's sort of where we're at. So the catharsis may... I don't even think it's rendering us impotent. I think we just are. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I think that this at least offers us some okay. moment of, shit, wouldn't that be nice, right? Yeah. Or um, that's, you know, that's interesting and entertaining, and it gives us some better ideas about where we can move incrementally in the future. Right. But yeah. there's no revolution happening. Want to know what hackers are doing right now? They're on 4chan sharing porn <laughs> or like oh, shutting down feminist websites or whatever. Doing They're not it, doing yeah. anything like this. Like, right, let's right. be honest about what's really happening. Yeah. So, I mean, there's no revolution like that, I think. Yeah, I want to chime in on this. The one thing that kind of a vision or a visual that kind of popped in my head, thinking about your kind of upside down pyramid, mm -hmm. it's, it's also, though, as you add more weight, you know, depending on where it is, it causes some imbalance in the right. pyramid, right? And one of the things I was thinking of is just thinking in terms of also the weight that comes through continually adding blocks onto this pyramid okay. and the pressure that comes with weight and thinking about that in terms of kind of political pressure placed on the populace because what I'm seeing is with something like Mr. Robot, while simultaneously like somebody like me, that watches that show and gets a sense of catharsis because I identify politically right. and experientially with the main character, right? I go, thank God somebody's finally putting forth in popular culture um, a representation of my worldview and my politics, right? right? Um, well, simultaneously that, that's happening. Um, what, what else I see happening in kind of a, a Chomsky-esque way is, is a consciousness raising. Mm. The exposure to ideas in a really palatable, interesting, romantic way, mm. right? Kids wanting to be like Mr. Robot, mm. right? Yeah. And that having some political effect, right? Um, but simultaneously, in the real world of politics, what we're seeing is a shift even further rightward in even more authoritarian and extremist um, violent practice mm -hmm. by the state. Mm -hmm. And so what, you know, the film that pops to mind is City of Men as kind of like near future, you know, prophecy, right? Like, and that, the world looking a lot more like that with kind of, like this Donald Trump phenomenon. I see, you know, he's extremist and he is, get him out of here, you know, to protesters beat the shit out of that guy, I'll pay for your, your, metal, legal, your legal bills, yeah. right? And that type of authoritarianism combined with um, a growing consciousness from something like Mr. Robot in particular youth markets, right? Mm -hmm. That are going to have a more, you know, you know, hence the support for Sanders among youth and shit like that. Right. Mm -hmm. like, and so what I see is a, 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 like a, a separating um, a dichotomy being created, a binary in which the pressure is great. And so as the political class gets more and more extreme mm -hmm. with somebody like Donald Trump being a viable candidate with mm -hmm. his authoritarianism, plus, so that's pulling way one side. Right. And then the other side are these fenced in marginalized populations as well as like kids that now have an Occupy-esque political mentality. Um, dealing with a much more authoritarianism and extreme. So what I see is a growing tension developing. Mm -hmm. Who know, I mean, ca capitalism is always really effective at marginalizing dissent. Yeah. But whereas we were talking so much in the 70s and 80s about the manufacture of consent, um, and people, you know, in a Gramsci-esque Gramsci notion of kind of like um, willingly submitting to illegitimate authority, what I see happening much more now is um, the veneer of consent being stripped, the, the veneer of, of willingness uh -huh. not being necessary anymore in, in the function, or at least not entirely necessary, but that's the trajectory. So that um, power 
is less and less concerned with the manufacturing consent. They're mm -hmm. much more concerned with straight power, right. authority. Mm -hmm. And that creates a really unstable situation. Mm -hmm. to, to critique kind of your notion of incrementalism, I'd like to bring in like Elaine Bajou's notion of the event, mm -hmm. which is you never know when it's going to happen. You only know after the fact. Mm -hmm. um, when tensions get so fucking tense that, sh that shit happens. Maybe people aren't hitting the street um, and occupying anymore, but maybe now they're like taking over factories or right. throwing fucking run or shooting at cops, right? And so when those kind of, I see those tensions as mm -hmm. becoming more likely, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Over the next 20 years, that's the city of men reference, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I don't see how that's really inescapable. It's gonna be interesting to see how effective and how intelligent the mm -hmm. state can flow and adapt to losing yeah. the ideological space it once held in, in, in youth minds. It, and it's going to have to resort to violence. Mm -hmm. And whenever the state mm -hmm. has rule, I mean, if the shit happened in Egypt and Tunisia, the shit can happen here. It's been, I mean, you know, the situation is much more dire in those in those um, in those political you know states. Yeah, and so right. keep adding the pressure. We'll see what happens. You know, I don't know. I just think that the tools to affect that change are much less effective than they would be here. So just take the Mr. Robot example where, let's say we acknowledge that the society is built mostly on a technological level at this point, where um, in order to affect capital in some way, you have to be able to affect the computers, or you have to be able to get at servers or do whatever. Right, there's no like physical uprising that can occur on any level. Let's be honest. This is a country that sp spends how many billions of dollars on a military that hasn't really done anything of consequence since what, like the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. right? Like we're spending that much money to maintain this ridiculous force. We know that there's no physical uprising. What's your uprising? Well, as Mr. Robot shows us, it's maybe this tech uprising. But here's where, here's where I think this stuff falls apart. When presented with the ability to have a revolution mm -hmm. or the ability to improve your situation in the capitalistic structure, mm -hmm. my belief mm -hmm. is that most people will choose to improve. So what happens with most hackers? Where do we get most of these people that work, uh, that work basically creating defenses these were ex-hackers, right? Um, that I listened to a podcast mm -hmm. a couple of weeks ago with the guy who was one of the dudes who helped run Google or whatever. And they basically went about hiring ex-hackers and all these dudes. Interesting. So if we yeah. offer you the money to yeah. get into the system, mm -hmm. will you then forego your ethic? or yeah, your which was ethic? a situation depicted in Mr. Robot. Right. Yeah. And... Um, well, in Mr. Robot, we have the main character who is emblematic of some, uh, you know, like, he can't be touched necessarily, right? right? He's still heroic by the end of this. But I'm not certain necessarily mm -hmm. how much that is not just our Hollywoodization yeah. of what might actually happen, right? right. Well, I think what you're pointing to, which is so super interesting to me, is the idea, and I'm going to say something, I'm not an anthropologist, but right. but this idea that capitalism is something that devours everything within it, yeah. no matter how revolutionary, and then spits it out as more as capitalism. Which yeah, could be so, Mr. Robot itself, right? Yeah, right. exactly. So, yeah, Mr. Robot itself, it can actually, you can do an analysis of the show as that, mm -hmm. as a commodification of revolutionary thought. And then it's done. And right. then it's done. And, and then it's, it's been done. done. Like, yeah. that's the, literally the sign of yeah. something being done. I mean, you see it, product. right, we, we, we made this complaint when we were involved in Occupy. It was mm -hmm. like, we were starting to see corporatization of the shirts of Occupy or the branding of Occupy. Jay Z, so, yeah. Yeah. Occupy yeah. All Streets. Exactly. And yeah. You, yeah, and then all of a sudden you have all these products out there yeah. that sort of give voice to uh, what fundamentally were anarchist ideas that uprose from people, right. but then get sort of devoured by capitalism and then regurgitated as something that you purchase. or something Che Guevara that, shirts, dude. Yeah, yeah. Che Guevara shirts, all yeah. of that stuff. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's well known. So it's like, 
you know, my question is then, how do you keep that sort of DIY or the do-it-yourself sort of ethic alive yeah. as an undercurrent? Is it always a sort of, because if you look at, you know, this is another piece of what I think is interesting about what you're saying, is that like, if, if where the movement, if where revolution moves is to the digital sphere, right. is that then just a reification of, like if we look at culture as, as one entity, as mm-hmm. like we've been talking about like cities as alive, or as culture as one entity, one living, breathing, right. one unified consciousness, then is that really just creating a, a sort of like a, um, a subculture within yeah, right. the larger sphere? Like of, a liver which processes it's just, yeah, it's just a, the, d- the it's, disease it's a and function. the antibodies. It, yeah, mm-hmm. and, and it never will actually overtake the whole system. Yeah, right. But, will but it's act- integral to its function. But it's integral to its function. To dispose yeah. of waste. Yeah. Yeah, and so then, yeah. how oh, does God. that? <laughs> yeah, then we're this sort is of actually an amazing string to go down. Dude. Yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, it's like okay. So to talk about like you're like we're both sort of coming to this thing where we're saying all right, um, the whatever the revolution is or mm-hmm. whatever that might be, mm-hmm. right? The only way that has like a petri dish to grow in is on the internet, right? Mm-hmm. Which is um, by the way, this is a, this is an aside. I don't accept this um, this assumption. But you don't accept this. <laughs> okay, um, we're playing with the idea. Yeah. I mean, well, well, let's just assume that that's the truth of the matter, right? Um, we have essentially an unregulated internet, like right now, right? Like mm-hmm. we can do, like you know, yeah. we can do whatever and we want. We're all retards. Yeah. <laughs> and if you've ever gone on a, an anonymous web, web board or a message board or any of the stuff that's happening on there, you can see what's going on with it. Cat pictures, yeah. um, <laughs> you know, a lot of those. Yeah. Um, a Which lot, I'm a big fan of. As well. I mean, look, no, nothing wrong with cat pictures. Yeah, right. That's fine. Um, but a lot of memification of stuff mm-hmm. and willingness. Well, not want to say willingness. Uh, affirmation of frankly some really fucked up beliefs, right? Yeah. So when some we really fucked up, some shit. fucked up shit. So what happens? I don't. You guys are probably not familiar with this because you're not like. Uh, I don't. I imagine neither of you guys are like video game people. No. But no. There was not recently, but like maybe a year back, a thing, a groundswell of. You want one of those? Sure. Uh, a groundswell of kind of fucking with feminists right. who were producing shit saying, hey, video games are super m- no, you take that. Uh, macho, misogynist, and also racist. Right? Uh-huh. Yeah. Like every single main character and everyone ever existed, that every game that ever existed is Which is like, like white dude. obvious right. on the surface true. Right. Which is straight up just yeah, This obvious. is true. That's just yeah. true, right? Right. Um, and dudes are literally like ruining women who work in the game's careers. And these are dudes yeah. who exist almost entirely in this digital sphere that we're talking about, right, right? Right, right? And this was what they chose, right? So a lot of what, a lot of the, um, a lot of the movements or the ideas that we choose for ourselves or a lot of the ones that we choose in general, if we allow people this much freedom, as much as we would like to think that they're going to do something which is going to be progressive or worthwhile or whatever, a lot of times they go regressive. Yeah, but here's and the, we're this seeing is that, 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 that Jesse cynicism that, coming in real strong right now. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> but we've seen it, right? Yeah. And so the internet is unregulated. We can do with it what we will, right? And the the problem is this is what we've chosen to do with it. Mm-hmm. We've decided, hey. Um, this chick makes YouTube videos about how maybe they should include more female characters in sure. a video game. Yeah. yeah. Let's get her, let's dox her, send her literally death threats and be pissed off about it. Mm-hmm. And I mean, this is mostly our youth, which has grown up almost entirely in this atmosphere or this biodome or whatever it yeah. is you want to call it. And this is what they have chosen, right? So what exists as the revolution? What's the symbol of the revolution, right? Let's say we accept that um, Anonymous, Mm -hmm. right, is that with their Guy Fox masks, Mm -hmm. which coincidentally, by the way, only became popular not after the original graphic novel was written, but 10, 15 years afterwards when a movie that sucks was made about Mm -hmm. it 
and took an anarchist book and shitted it up. Yeah, right. Right? Did it. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that's kind of where I'm arriving at it, is yeah. that, that I just feel like there's, when you allow the freedom, I think part of what the but, government has been successful at is realizing that when left to their own devices, most people that, even if you have an inkling of revolution or revolutionary thought or ideas about something, at some point you're going to have a you're going to have an ideal that's real fucked up or you're going to indulge it in something super incompetent or you're just going to do something right, that doesn't right. accomplish anything. So just do that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Why? I mean, I, I'm doubtful that the government really even needs to regulate the internet because now that we've well, seen what Because they're happen, on dipshit autopilot. Right. You're on dumbass autopilot. Right. You can just roll through. But here, here's, here's, here's my point, though. That, like, challenge eight is, Gabe, is it okay if I respond to this? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. All right. Yeah. Well, because... Like, you know, philosophical terms, you know, um, who, I forget who was it that's, uh, it was probably Altus Aragon, who said basically, the, the moment at which you think you're most free is when you're most deeply rooted in ideology, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So when one gets to practice their freedom, and ideologically speaking, the internet is a free space, right? right? This is where you can be yourself, in comment sections, you're utterly free to say anything and holy you fucking shit, want is that to do, amazing. Yeah. right? Yeah. But my problem is, we're working on an enlightenment conception of a blank slate self. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is that very freedom is so fucking deeply constructed by all these systems of authority and power that the, that you can't just say, okay, at this point, bang, somebody's coming in and they're making a free choice. They're not. They're they're being worked by ideology like a fucking puppet. Mm -hmm. oh, ideology absolutely. is a fucking misogyny, patriarchy, classism, absolutely. you know what I mean? And so what you're doing is you've, you've been filtering somebody on a particular track, let's say a 20-year-old kid, from fucking deeply within the institutions of education, through popular culture, through um, the, the psych office, through you know all these kind of ideological apparatuses, right? And then saying, okay, now go ahead and be free. And then, of course, they reproduce all this horrific shit in the moment of freedom. But it was because they were making a choice. It was because mm -hmm. their very ideas and horizons of freedom have already been constructed for them. I'm right. even more cynical than you in particular ways, which is I don't think individual freedom even fucking exists. I basically think that the individual is a confluence of social forces, um, a reflection of all the social forces yeah. put upon when someone the individual barely fucking exists. Mm -hmm. The idea of independent will fucking barely exists. Mm -hmm. But what I do think is there can be radical interventions at the ideological construction sites. Right? And then so you could have people put, putting shit up in the inter, on the internet radically different, but you're going to have to intervene in the educational system in kindergarten. Right? And so the question is where, where does political intervention begin? Because you are right. If you grant freedom for morons to go ahead and just be free, then you're going to get free dipshittery. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which is basically what we get. Really interesting. You know I, mean? I think about this all the time. You know, if anybody's listening to this, we live in Los Angeles. We're basic, you know, where I, I think about this when I look at the ocean. I like get, get out to that sort of horizon. You mm. see the Pacific. And you realize at some point that the, the only reason we're standing here is because people have pushed westward. You know, the oh, ideal God. of colonialism. Yeah, yeah that's a, that's a, that is a yeah. fucking unsettling feeling. It's a, and, and you're yeah, like... I had that too. And then you, and, you, and you think about it, and you think, well, besides Hawaii, we're as far west as it gets. Yeah, right? then you... Western mean. expansion is... We went even further. We hopped onto an island. <laughs> yeah. Yo, let's go even further. Right? We just keep... And, and the idea is then that colonialism <laughs> then circumvents the nav... In, in the digital sense. Mm. That it keeps going around and, right. cloning, and cloning itself and uh, colonizing... And, um, and you think in the physical realm, we've gone as far as we can right. west. If you're thinking about it from a western standpoint, where sure. the ideas have been pushed as far to the precipice as possible, up to the ocean, yeah. yeah, all of that stuff, it's been Possibly pushed to the nth degree. Yeah. Right. Where is there left to go? Well, there's, you know, East? there's the fucking moon. Or there's the... Let's the go ahead, like the Martian. Yeah, the Martian. The perfect it, ideological vehicle for prepping the human mind to abandon this shithole and just move on with that uh, settler colonialism. Yeah, what's mm -hmm. next? Right? Mm -hmm. what, what's next? And what we have is, well, we've got this digital realm. 
And if you think about Cormac McCarthy and you think about his novels, especially... Um, which we love thinking about. Yeah, we love thinking about it. By the way, we're all in on. <laughs> which, yeah. which is just, you know, the, we're, while, we're circum, while we're circulating around this idea of freedom, and he's playing with the idea of like how freedom plays out when you have no one watching you. Right. And the forces that you come upon when you walk into a world yeah. that is, you know, you're, like that's Western expansion. He's talking about the West being formed. And what happens is brutalization, you know, basically all this dark unconscious stuff that's happening with the anonymous and the, you know, the threatening of, of, of feminist writers and yeah. all that stuff that was happening in his novels right. in the physical space, except now it's happening in the digital space. Sure. Because right. that's a place that's unregulated. It's mm -hmm. the new West, so to speak. Sure, yeah, that's a good point. Um, one, but here, oh, let, let me make one, because I forgot about yeah, my second point ahead. that I wanted to make. My second point was not accepting the fundamental um, assumption that the revolution needs to occur in the digital sphere. I basically believe that... Like, and well, what, I'm just saying that's the only place it can occur. Yeah, and I, 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 well, rather than just yeah. That, I think we have material evidence. I think the only place it can occur is the fucking streets. I think that digital's already fucking co-opted by capital and very similar to Gabe's analysis. Where I see the fucking revolution happening is in Ferguson. Uh -huh. I think... Go, keep shooting fucking marginalized populations. I don't think those are those are those are those are not riots. Those are rebellions. Mm -hmm. Those are miniature revolutions. Right. If you ask any of those activists, I mean, I'm talking about Black Lives Matter activists. They are revolutionary, right? And they're not getting mainstream representation, but they're informed politically. They're anarchists. They're Marxist. They're revolutionaries, and they're they're you know strategically. Moving forward, coming back. Moving forward, coming back. Now, are, can they successfully overthrow the government right now? No. no. Would they like to see that? Yeah. Right. And and they're doing work and they're organizing action. Now, this has nothing to do with the you know chance for success or whatever. But point being, where I see real revolutionary activity is not fucking anonymous. Right. It's people getting out on the street, standing up to cops, facing their own death. In order to see a new world. For right. me, that right. is the definition of revolution. If you will stand up to a cop at the risk of your own life to bring about a new system, and very often we can we can ask them, you can go read about them, they're very clear about what they want to see, which is social and political revolution. Mm -hmm. This is much mm -hmm. and so that that so it is happening in the streets for me. And, and in fact that's the only place it can happen. Right. Mm -hmm. Here's where I would suggest Here's where I would suggest maybe that that's... I understand that's what their intent is. But how do these things get um, disseminated, right? How do we learn of these things? And here's what I was getting at with the incrementalism. Is the idea that all we can hope for at this point are these incredibly small victories that lead to small progressive change. Okay. And that's kind of it, mm -hmm. right? Because no matter what Black Lives Matter does... There's no grander social or political revolution. I just feel like that realistically can happen. Right. Here's what can happen. You see this shit, and you see it often enough that you see it on Twitter, or you see it on the internet, mm -hmm. the unregulated space, where the media doesn't have the power over, right? Mm -hmm. right. And where people bitch constantly about how this is not being covered on CNN. Why does Don Lemon keep talking about black-on-black <laughs> black crime? Right. Why doesn't anybody address any of this shit, yeah. right? Yeah. Where is that coming from? Mm -hmm. That's coming from the internet, right? That's mm -hmm. my feeling. Yeah. So that's, that small incremental bit of revolution you're talking about, you're right. Those are the real evolu revolutionaries, the ones who are going onto the streets. But how are they being heard? Yeah. They're not being heard. Yeah, no. They're yeah. only being heard through the internet. Right? Yeah, yeah. The media is not going... Don Lemon literally went out into the Ferguson streets and decided that was it. And that <laughs> we, we, we have two five-minute segments on my backcast. One, Can we? shitting on Game of Thrones. Shitting, two, on, Don shitting on Don Lemon. <laughs> <laughs> but remember... See what, he, Don, what Don Lemon's up to this week in his fucking uh, self-hating racism. Remember his reaction to that, though? Before... Bef or uh, either before or after perfectly civil or at least mostly civil which whatever who cares if they were or not it was an awful thing that Hopefully happened anyway work. right yeah. 
were fired with, upon with tear gas canisters, yeah. right? But man, Don Lemon decided that would be a good time to complain that it smelled vaguely of weed, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, me- the media is not doing this work, right? Yeah, right. There's no where there's no acceptable space where that work can even be heard. Right. The internet, the digital sphere is the only place where this stuff can be heard. Right. So even if the revolution You know, uh, you know you're making a real Marxist analysis right here. I'm uh, just gonna throw that out. <laughs> the uh, modes of representation are controlled by capital. Mm-hmm. They you know control mm-hmm. dominant forms of representation, therefore yeah. yeah, you know. Right. And just but, a quick comment too about our process is that we've like progressively shifted into sort of like how we're trying to piece through this in our own experiences as uh, people living, doing, working in our places. And you know what? There's going to be, you know, I'm, I'm pretty conscious as we've been talking about how there's going to be some massive critiques of what we're saying. Yeah. There's going to be some utter destruction of our ideas uh-huh. uh, for yeah. anybody listening to this. There, you know, there I will can't be wait people. To Facebook comment. <laughs> <laughs> but but people from you know people who are on the ground doing this stuff, putting their lives, are going to say these fucking white guys, privileged yeah. guys, have it all wrong. Mm-hmm. And so I just kind of want to point out that that's a piece of the conversation that's missing from from this. Right? Yeah. In, right. in real time. You know? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, but I'll just say that I've spent my time in the streets too. You know, yeah. I mean? and like, yeah, I'm down. You know yeah, what I mean? like, you know, I'm, I'm as down as anybody to do anything. You know I'll what just mean? say, it's what like, can you, what can you disagree with? <laughs> 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 well, my point is 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 um, is really about the unification of these ideas. You know, the marrying of the digital and the on the foot work. Yeah. Um, because what I think we're seeing, especially with the rise of the popular pop, you wouldn't see a Bernie Sanders um, five. You know, the last couple we saw something close to that, which was Obama, that was giving some some hints towards some of this stuff. Yeah. Now Bernie's kind of explicitly talking about this stuff, and on the other hand, you have Trump, who's giving people a sense of complacency. I'll take care of it for you, so to yeah, speak. Sure. And um, so what we see is an increasing illusory, I would call, division of people who all sort of want something to change, mm-hmm. right? If, and if that's a unifying force, how do we, how do we all uh, collectively center around those ideas while in, including everybody's different ideas about what that looks like? Yeah. This is a super interesting point because I've actually, this is something I've actually been thinking about a lot lately because I've been seeing what's happening in, and this political season has been super interesting to me, not for a lot of the reasons that the media has chosen, right? Look at Donald Trump, the former reality star, becoming, possibly becoming, like, who cares? The reasons people are voting for Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders are shockingly similar, Uh right? Yeah. And both of those are access to the capitalist system, right? Hmm. Why is it that I can't fucking make any money? Why is it that I can work however many jobs and I'm still not able to yeah. afford anything, right? Well, I mean, essentially what Donald Trump and and Bernie Sanders are are speaking to is the economic annoyance. They're just speaking to a different demographic. Yes, yes. But about the same thing, which is why about it's, it's, the same thing, but with radically different prognosis. Right, but that practice. here's what I'm gonna suggest. To a lot of people, that doesn't matter. Yeah, no, I right? agree with you on that. Like, I don't. I think a lot of people, and I've been seeing this a lot, and I've been kind of sh- trying to. I've occasionally commented on it when I can, but a lot of people who are into this, who are in the Bernie Sanders movement, um, are not recognizing that the revolution for its sake is not. Right. Um, mm-hmm. Is not. Like, okay, the revolution that Bernie Sanders is promoting is not the same as the Donald Trump one, mm-hmm. yeah. right? right? The revolution for its own sake as its own concept is not necessarily what we want. Do we want to have, like, I'm, this may be taking it a little far, but I'm sure that when Hitler was coming into power, people thought that was pretty and it revolutionary. Only took about, what, 60 minutes? Yeah. To get to, like, <laughs> we got into it. <laughs> 
But the thing is, the Trump movement, you're essentially arriving at... A, the, the problem is always the economic, the economic situation. Can you, can you let me in, right? Mm, let yeah. me have a moment. Mm. Can I own something? Can I purchase what I want, right? right. Can I live comfortably? Mm -hmm. Can I not work a billion hours a week, right? Can I do that? And each of them are offering essentially the same thing, one with form and one without. Uh -huh. But that the form doesn't matter mm -hmm. is what I'm thinking. Yes. And what I think is what's it's come down to is this vague idea of I will change the system. Well, do you think that's mistaken though? Like in the sense that, yeah, we, we like, let's say we accept that and mm -hmm. then say, yeah, people want access to the economy. Right. Right. Why shouldn't they? No, they should. Mm -hmm. But here's what I'm saying is that people, um, in moments of economic weakness will flail wherever they can towards fascism possibly towards maybe an actual socialist right, right huh? they'll go wherever they can but where they're not hearing that is here where hillary clinton exists <laughs> right and so that's definitely not appealing right? Right, 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 right so we have a candidate who really should win in a landslide if and, and if the, the that probably I might has yeah. to lose to trump by three points right she might actually lose, yeah. which is insane, yeah, right. but that might happen.